This morning, if you turn in your pew Bibles to page 910, we're continuing in uh, a look at the book of Acts, uh, which is all about the, the birth and the uh, growth of the church. In the gospel this morning, you just heard, Jesus takes the disciples on a little journey through the scriptures as he's walking with them for the purpose of proving that the scriptures that predicted his coming have been fulfilled. And this is one of the, the, the main things about the gospel message is that uh, the coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah was not something that just happened in isolation by itself. It was literally the fulfillment of all the promises of God. And when you hear people say uh, about Jesus in the Old Testament, uh, oftentimes people will say, well, I don't see any name of Jesus in the Old Testament. It's because they're all pictures of what he's going to look like in the sense of what he's going to do and ultimately how he's going to deliver us. And so Peter, in his sermon uh, in Acts chapter 2, is addressing this in the context of the fulfillment of the prophecies. And if you look at Acts chapter 2, and we're just going to look at one verse here this morning, Acts 2 verse 39 <clears throat> for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself this was a blockbuster uh, because up until then the promise was only for the children of Israel uh, it was supposed to be a promise that would bless the world but they had taken the law and they had taken the blessings of what they knew about God and turned it into something that was a private possession of themselves. And so it was all about keeping everybody else out. And what Peter is saying is that dividing wall has been broken down, and now the promise is for everyone, everyone who receives Jesus. <clears throat> Our God is a God who fulfills promises. He makes promises, and he fulfills them. In Genesis, he creates a good earth. Everything about reality as we know it on this planet is pronounced good. And in Genesis, we also see Adam and Eve, our forebears, take that promise and basically trample on it. Jesus has given them a, a, a choice. He said, if you obey, I'm, I'm sorry, God has given them a choice. If you obey me, you're going to prosper. If you rebel against me, you're going to bring a curse down on yourself. And that's what happens. But even as sin corrupts everything in the world, from childbirth to everyday work, God, in his mercy, does something. And this is a, this is a picture of the coming Messiah, but it doesn't say Jesus. He gives them a covering. And it's not just a covering of anything. This isn't like woven straw or something like that. It's a animal skin, something durable, but something that required a sacrifice and blood to be shed. So right at the dawn of redemptive history, you can see a picture of where this is going. God is going to fulfill his promise through the death of his son, and he's going to make us acceptable to him through what he does. And so that promise is what starts and as Genesis goes on, uh, we see a repeat of the promise over and over and over again in all kinds of different ways. And obedience brings life. Disobedience brings death. God doesn't demand obedience just because he wants obedient pets. He wants a relationship. He wants a restoration. He wants his sons and daughters to know him and to love him just as he knows and loves us. And he gives warnings. And finally, the covenant is made with a man named Abraham. And through Abraham, it's God's intentions to bless you and me and all future generations, to bless the world with the knowledge of who he is. And it becomes the central promise pointing to Christ, that God will do himself what we cannot do. He'll make us right with him. He'll make a relationship that works and lasts. God's holy, so we need to be holy, but we can't make ourselves holy, so he's going to do it at tremendous cost and suffering through his son Jesus. 
God essentially has to find a way to kill the cancer of sin in us without killing us. And somebody pays the price for it, and that somebody is the Messiah. That's what all the prophecies were about in, in Isaiah, you know, that this would be a suffering servant. This would be someone uh, by whose stripes we would be healed. And they're all pictures of Jesus. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. This is the promise of the deliverer that Peter is announcing. And it's in the fulfillment of the scriptures. Uh, for instance, in Isaiah 44.3, Isaiah predicted this uh, about 600 years before. For I will pour water on the thirsty ground and the streams on the dry ground I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And that's what Peter's speaking to. Uh, if there were any Jews in the crowd, they would know what this meant. Jeremiah 32, 38 is another example. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. So Jesus' death and resurrection have done what we couldn't do. They've given us, it's given us a new heart, and it's given us a new belonging. Now, why did Jesus have to die? Paul talks about this in Romans 8. Basically, he's saying, you know, the Ten Commandments, right? Ten Commandments tell you everything you need to do to be right with God and to be walking in the way that you're created for, right? Can anybody keep the Ten Commandments? Not for two minutes, right? Uh, because Jesus said even the intents of our hearts are what corrupt us far long before we ever do anything with our hands. So the law is a good thing, except nobody can keep it. So that means nobody can bridge that gap between themselves and God in their own power. So Paul says this in Romans 8, 3, where he's making the case for this. He says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sin. Isn't that amazing? What he's saying is, the very things that you and I can't do basically control sin in our life. You know, we try it. A lot of people think Christianity is sin management. You know, is that you just try to mitigate disaster, you know, and, and you're always feeling guilty and you can never be good enough. And that's living under the law. That's futile. It's just never going to work. What Paul is saying here is that God in himself has satisfied all the needs of righteousness and taking care of all of your sin from yesterday to today to the future. Isn't that amazing? And it's something called grace. So now you can relax and you can know that you're accepted to God. You can know that your sins are forgiven and you can have a future and a love relationship with him and worship him like we do here. It takes the sting out of sin and the death of it. And notice that Peter, back in Acts chapter 2, says the promise of this forgiveness and new life is for us and our children. This, again, would have been very familiar to New Testament Jews of the time because they understood God's promises in the sense of a covenant with families and groups and tribes and nations. Uh, there wasn't anything of the kind of evangelical individuality that we have uh, you know, in American Christianity, which is all about me, you know, uh, you make your decision, you know, which you really don't because Ephesians 2.8 says you couldn't have in the first place is all God's doing, but who cares, you know. Uh, <laughs> they knew it as a covenant. You see in later on in Acts, a jailer and his entire family come into faith in Christ. And that includes servants and little kids because God honors covenants. So, the mystery of this also is that it's a free gift. God's the one who finds us. 
You know, I no longer tell people that I gave my life to Christ at age, you know, 20, what was it, 24, 23, something like that, you know, uh, because I didn't. He found me at that age. All of us have been found. There's no difference between us and everybody else out there. We're not better than them because we're Christians. We were found. You and I had nothing to do with it. It's all grace. It's all grace. It's all Christ. So I think a good description for the body of Christ would be those who have been found by God. God does everything to give us everything. And so Peter says, that's what this promise is like. It's for you and it's for your children. But notice also that he says, it's not just for the Israelites. This isn't going to stay within the borders of Israel the way it has up to that point where the law has been locked up by the temple elite and people uh, you know, had to toe the line. He's saying now it's also for those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And again, there's this mystery of, of how our will and God's will interact. And it's a mystery. It'd be like saying, you know, this door over here has a sign and says, uh, everyone welcome. And so, you know, you get up and you, okay, I'll go through it. And you go through and then you look on the other side and it says chosen by God. And you're like, wait a minute, but I'm the one who made the choice. But it's really God calling us to himself. And that's a mystery. Nobody can understand that kind of love and grace. But that's how God does it for all who are far off. And the promise is as good today as it was then. But, like in all sermons, there's a problem. Right? Right? And the problem is me. Not, and you. I mean, not just <laughs> you know, right. It's us. Right? <clears throat> There's something in us that wants to contribute. We want a little piece in there, right? So it's like, well, I'm glad that Christ saved me on the cross, uh, but I, I can add this to it, you know? Uh, and, and I can have a part in it this way, and God would be really lucky to have me on his team <laughs> because, you know, I'm a priest or I'm on the vestry or, I, you know, you know, coach Little League or something like that. There's always something we want to do to make ourselves our own saviors because that's what's at the back of all that human effort. I want to save myself. Why do I want to save myself? So I can live the way I want to live. I don't want to live the way God wants me to live. That's what, that's what the scripture says. The spirit is against the flesh, warring all through our, our earthly lives that war is going on. And we live uh, very much in a, in a time now where people are bending religion and philosophies to conform with their preferences. You know, I would prefer God to be this way. Uh, you know, and that's why you hear people say, the God I believe in is, and it's always funny, it always turns out to be just like them. <laughs> you know, the God I believe in doesn't require me to go to church. They don't go to church. You know, the God I believe in always forgives everything because I like to sin all the time. You know? And so we want to make God into our image, but it all starts with us wanting to contribute something, be our own savior. That's why Peter starts this whole address with a word, repent. Saying, have another mind. Turn around. Repent. You can't make yourself your own savior. If you could, it would have worked out a long time ago. But the 20th century proves, you know, the most bloody century yet, uh, that us being our own saviors doesn't exactly work out too good. Something in us called sin is always worming its way around. And yet, the glory of the gospel is God has taken care of even that. And he's made it so that we're righteous in his sight. How did he do that? <clears throat> Think of it this way. Jesus, on the cross, gives up his life for your life. He gets in front of the bullet headed toward you, right, of death and hell and separation from God. He takes the bullet. He dies, right? You get his driver's license, 
you get his uh, you know, uh, academic record, you know, his PhD, you get everything he's earned, everything he is, you get all the credit for his good life. He gets all the blame for yours. That's what the substitutionary atonement is all about. He gets all the blame for everything I've done and you've done. And we get all the credit for his perfect life. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that do something to you? You know, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. So repentance, instead of being, well, I'm going to try harder tomorrow, right? Repentance is, no, I've got a free gift here that changes my heart. And that's what Peter is saying. The Holy Spirit has been poured out to change our hearts, not just our minds or the list of things that we want to do better. God doesn't actually need us for anything, and yet he needs us because he loves us, right? When you have a little child, a little infant, you don't need anything from that child, right? You don't say, get on the tractor and mow the lawn today, you know? Wow, take your hands out of the wheel and you can, you know. Uh, you know, you just want to love that little child, and as the child grows up, you want to have that love reciprocated so you've got a relationship. That's what God wants. From all eternity, all he ever wanted was you. That's why he made you be instead of not be. He made you exactly the way you are because he wanted you to live and to be. Isn't that amazing? From all eternity, you're not an accident like you might hear on the History Channel. Yeah. This was an intentional love act. So the resurrection is the key to all of this. When people say, well, I, don't, well you know, I just don't believe in Christianity because it's just all made up by people who you know, pass one story to another and, and then you know, it just got all blurred up and it's just a collection of myths and stuff like that except for the fact of the resurrection. The resurrection happened in real time. It happened with witnesses. And uh, sometimes people say, well, yeah, but the Bible says that, and I don't believe the Bible, so why should I you know, believe in any of that stuff? And, and usually they haven't read it, too, but listen to this in 1 Corinthians 15. I won't read all of it, but Paul is describing the, the historical event, and he said that... Uh, Christ died according to the scriptures, okay, the promises fulfilled. He was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. He appeared to Peter, and then he said he appeared to more than 500 people. And Paul adds, most of whom are still alive today. So that means Paul put it out on the line there. That would be like somebody saying this today saying that Christ has appeared to 500 people and they're alive today. And here's the list. You can Google them, you know, and find them <laughs> and check it out. 500 crazy delusional people, you know? So Paul is saying in time and in history, this really happened and there's real evidence for this. What this is all about is the resurrection is the key to our relationship with Christ. Because it not only guarantees a relationship with God, it guarantees us something called life that goes on forever. You know, the Bible calls it eternal life, but it's a life that punches even through death, even through the experience of death. The promise wasn't fulfilled in some dark corner somewhere. It was on CNN, live, for the whole world to see. And I think some of the biggest challenges that we face uh, it may be money, it may be health issues, it may be uh, uncertainty in your job, it may be struggles with your kids or your families. In every single one of those things, the resurrection is there because behind every disappointment, every death is resurrection. We live in a death and resurrection paradigm as followers of Christ. And that means that the worst things that happen in this world can be followed by a resurrection for us. You know, sometimes people think, well, if I, if I follow Christ, if I receive what he's done for me, that'll make my life easier. Anybody having an easy life following Christ, right? 
Sometimes. I mean, sometimes God will work miraculously to provide for us. Uh, many times God will work miraculously to heal us. So he's always there. He's always making himself known with the evidence. But what makes our life different is a new heart. It makes us, we're different in the circumstances. The circumstances might not change, but we're different in it. And see, that's the hope and the witness that we have to the world. You know, hopefully people will say, you know, you're going through the same thing as they are, and yet you're totally different. And they'll ask, why is it, you know, that you're like this? I, I remember there was a, a young woman who uh, moved. She used to be part of Epiphany worked in a very hostile office environment, uh, was known to be a Christian, uh, took all the usual jabs and ridicule, but was looked up to as like a mediating person within all the office uh, politics and all the backbiting and, and all that stuff. And she left. She, she got a new job. She was going to move on. And that office personally brought her out to lunch and they mourned her leaving. Even though they didn't, they didn't like her as a Christian, but they mourned what they were going to lose. She was a force for good in an evil, petty place. And they told her, we're going to be sorry. I don't know what we're going to do without you being here. Just her being there. That's the life of the resurrection that we carry with us doesn't make our life always easy, but the fulfillment of the promise that we have in Christ makes us different people. We always have that resurrection hope. So we are people who live for the promise, the promise that begins in Genesis, that goes all the way through what we read about the new heaven and the new earth, the resurrection of our bodies. We're going to say that in just a minute here as part of our creed. We live according to a promise from a promise keeper who ensures the delivery of his own promise. And so, Father, we thank you for your abundant love and your grace that works even in our sin and makes us your sons and daughters because of your love for us through your son, Jesus. Help us, Lord, to know the new hearts that you've already placed in us and to walk in this life with a sense of joy in hardships, a sense of peace in trouble, and a sense of hope in your promise. Amen. <clears throat>